In Revelation part four, lesson eight. Uh, this is a second part of a two-week study. Um, what subject? Day of the Lord. Day of the Lord. Very good. Uh, one of always. Sometimes you think it's really obvious, but we all need to kind of bring our minds back into the same place. So as we begin, obviously we are uh, studying the Day of the Lord because it's pertinent to our study of Revelation and everything else. We're going to handle today, similar to what we did last week, where we're going to look at the events that might be before, during, or after the Day of the Lord. So we're going to put that up here. Okay, I'm going to draw my lines a little further over, giving myself a little bit more in the during column, <laughs> because that's the one that we're going to focus on the most. But by way of review, we want to think about what a few things that we learned last week. I mean, we learned a lot of things last week, but we kind of want to put some uh, concluding statements or some big chunky markers, let's put it that way. And I'm going to write them in a different color just to distinguish between last week and this week. Not that they're different than what is going to be true of what we found this week. But what are some of the things that we know, we saw last week, different parts of Scripture that are going to happen before the day of the Lord, that have to happen before? Do you remember? None? Okay. <laughs> um, in 2 Thessalonians, we know that something is going to be revealed. The man of lawlessness. man of lawlessness. Okay, so before we know the man of lawlessness. Lawlessness. Sorry. Is revealed. We also know something else from that chapter. Something has to come first. The apostasy. The apostasy. Right. So the apostasy has to come first. Now, another thing we know that... How is the man of lawlessness revealed? It says it in that chapter. He sits on the throne. Right. Where? In what throne? Temple. In the temple. So he enters the temple. He sets himself up at, on a throne. He sets him up, sits and takes his seat, it says. And he sets himself up as what? God. So he exalts himself above every god, and he sets himself up as God. Okay? That's in 2 Thessalonians. That is how he's revealed. And... But another way of putting that is, at that point, he will be alive, and he will be on the scene, as we've called it. He'll be in existence, he'll be on this earth doing stuff. But if we were exist, if we were watching those events happen, like right now, and we've done, oh, we've done this, uh, through centuries and generations past, they've looked at someone and said, I wonder if. Yeah. If this is the man, is this, because he's called the man of lawlessness here and the son of destruction in 2 Thessalonians, what else do we call him from other parts of Scripture? Antichrist. The Antichrist, and we also call him the beast, the beast of Revelation. <laughs> right. So wherever you are in Scripture and you're looking at those descriptions and everything else, there have been times in history, and we'll just use one, Hitler, is one that people might have said, is he the Antichrist? Is he this man of lawlessness? Is he the beast? Okay, was he, um, Can we can answer that question in, from, no, he was not. Partly because we know he never walked into the temple and declared himself as God. Okay, some references and biographies of him said that he saw himself as there was some German god, I don't remember the German god's name, but he saw himself, styled himself as that, you know, that god on earth, in essence. Um, but he never did this particular action. There wasn't a temple. Did he go against God's people? Absolutely, he went against God's people. So you see why people might have thought that. We could do that now. Um, and we can speculate and think and certainly be looking, but don't shoehorn something in because you want it to work, right? Mm -hmm. Don't take one little description and say, oh, this is obvious. Okay, so he is revealed. There will be no doubt whatsoever when that event happens, right? Mm -hmm. But he will be in existence and on the scene prior to that. Okay, so the man of lawlessness is revealed. Okay. Yes, did somebody ask, was somebody asking something? Okay. The man of lawlessness is revealed. We know that event 
is tied to what point in the Revelation timeline? Seventh the seventh trumpet. Right, at the seventh trumpet. Now, just to be reminded, a result of going back to Revelation, when the seventh trumpet sounds, what comes out of the seventh trumpet? Seven bowls. The seven bowls. And in them, is the, what? Wrath of God. the wrath of God is finished. Okay, so always remember that. When There's other things that happen in the seventh trumpet. So it's not just the only thing, but as a result of the seventh trumpet, we have those final events, the seven bowls, and those seven bowls, as they're poured out, the wrath of God is in those bowls, and it's poured out on the earth, and when they're completed, when they're finished, the wrath of God is finished, and that's why the phrase in Revelation is, it is finished, all right? That part of what God's plan is will be finished as those seven bowls. Is that the end of everything? There's more, right. But that wrath of God is finished. That final thing will happen. Okay, so that seventh trumpet is extremely significant. So we know that when the man of lawlessness is revealed, and he is on the scene prior to the day of the Lord, when he is revealed starts the events that start the time frame for the day of the Lord. So we can tie the beginning of the day of the Lord to the seventh trumpet which happens to fall in that pivotal point, midpoint of the Revelation events, correct? Okay. I kind of wish I had like a <laughs> Revelation timeline up there all the time and we could just go yeah. point to it. So I, I go like this, you know, yeah. so you can remember a ghost image up there of the, of the uh, old timeline that we will get back to, I'm sure. So those are two events that we saw last week that have to occur before... <laughs> Did we see anything else last week that had to occur or will occur before? And I'll give you a hint. Um, as you filled out your charts last week and this week, you, if you saw events in nature, things that are going to be seen in the natural realm, we saw something that's going to happen and we know it happens before and we can tie it to a time in Revelation as well. What is going to happen? Do you know what that is? I think I'm giving you enough hints, but maybe not. Very good. The moon is blood. You've got it written down. You took good notes. Very good. Okay. So the sun turned to darkness. Okay. So we've got specifically the sun turned to darkness. The moon is blood. And this is prior to the day of the Lord. And as Sandy was saying, the moon turning blood is the sixth seal of Revelation. So uh, we know the sixth seal where the moon is blood happens before the day of the Lord. Okay. Well, again, if we're lining up our Revelation events, we've got first the seven what? Seals. seals. Mm -hmm. And out of the seventh seal come the seven, seven trumpets. trumpets. So they're next. And out of the seventh trumpet, we've already said, are the seven bowls. So if the seventh trumpet is here, then the sixth seal is back here. So it is before the day of the Lord. Okay. But we saw that through a lot of the prophecies last week, that point that we can point to a, a point in Revelation as well, tie it together. So with the, the events start with the seventh trumpet when the man of lawlessness is revealed. There's other things in Revelation uh, we know happen. That's when the two witnesses have been taken up to heaven. That's the end of the sixth trumpet, and then the seventh trumpet sounds. So as we're tying these things together, okay? Um, we know from uh, last week. That was some of the before. Was there anything else from our before column of last week that we want to remember this week? What wonders were happening. Wonders? Okay. In, in heaven and earth, right? There were not, we've already mentioned the one, the moon turning into blood and the sun being dark, okay? There's lots of events uh, happening in nature. We also see a lot of events happening in nature during, right? And even some possibly after. Um, <clears throat> right now I'm trying to get some big chunky things like um, what are some of the things that we know for, in our review from last week that we can say are true of the during time, of the day of the Lord itself? What would we call it? A time of what? Amos told us it's a time of darkness and gloom. Mm -hmm. No escape from judgment. Okay, there's uh, judgment and right, uh, absolute judgment, right? Mm -hmm. There's no escape. And destruction. 
and destruction, right? Does it come like a thief in the night? Right. And who, when it was saying thief in the night, who's it going to come unaware to? Because there's a group that it's not going to be in. Unbelievers. unbelievers. So the thief in the night reference is talking about unbelievers are not going to be prepared. But who is going to be prepared? Should be prepared. The believers. Right. If you trust and believe what God has said in this word, we should be prepared. And that's part of what we're doing, is we're becoming prepared. And hopefully as a result, we will make this and some of this information available to others are pointing back to that it is in here and we can be prepared. And we have the promise through, I think it's Amos, the prophet, that says God will not do anything without first revealing it to his people. I think it's in Amos. Okay, I'd have to go. I've got it marked. Um, but there is going to be judgment. Who primarily was the focus of the judgment? Who is this judgment against? Primarily. I'm sorry? The unsaved. Unsaved, but in... in uh, Yes, but in the prophecies we were talking, and there's, a, there's another word that's used a lot. There's, who's going to be gathered? Who's the, going to be the judgment against? The nations. Kings. Right. So there's no escape. But it's going to be against primarily the nations were mentioned. That's what we saw last week. Um, that usually is a difference distinguishing all the other nations of the world and who? What's the distinction? Israel. Israel. So it's either Israel and everybody else. Okay. So this judgment is, at the focus of that judgment that's talked about is against other nations, not Israel. But we also saw what? Who else is going to be judged? We saw nations are going to be judged, and I just gave you the distinction. Israel. <laughs> Israel. Thank you. <laughs> so there's going to be judgment for Israel as well, okay? And again, yes, you're right, that judgment is against the unsaved within both categories, okay? Um, so those are some of the things. Now, what did we see anything last week that's going to happen after? Earth destroyed. Right, we see, actually, that's during, okay? So we've got heaven... Heaven and earth are destroyed, right, by fire. So what happens after that? A new heaven. There you go. So we have a new heaven and a new earth. So even from what we saw last week, putting it back in our Revelation timeline, this starts when? In Revelation? Seventh trumpet and extends through what time? The thousand year reign. Right, because it's after the thousand year reign that the heaven and earth as we know it is destroyed and then there's a new heaven, new earth, and new Jerusalem. Right, those are chapters 21 and 22. The new is chapters 21 and 22 if you want to mark it as far as like where it's referenced. But we saw that in Old Testament prophecy as well. We saw it in other places that earth will be destroyed as part of this day of the Lord. So the capping events, the beginning and the end of the day of the Lord, are set by, if we just stick even just to Revelation, we're, they're set by Revelation's seventh trumpet and the thousand year, going through the thousand year reign. Okay? So part of the thousand year reign and part of what you saw last week is something is going to be restored to Israel. Did you see, do you remember what it said about Israel that's going to be restored in Israel? A remnant. Definitely a remnant. There's going to be a remnant in Israel. And their fortunes are restored. Someone let them out. Yeah. Thank you. Um, there go. Save the world. Y'all are very comfortable right now that my dogs are on the same. Okay, so these are some of the things we saw last week. There's a whole lot more. We can't fill our chart. But I wanted to put those up there as reminders of some of the things that were revealed to us last week. And then, did we see 
the same things this week? Did we see anything contradicting this this week? Did we see a different focus this week? Let's just continue with what we saw. So as you're looking, we're going to start through, as she took us through, Zephaniah. Zephaniah is one of the minor prophets uh, found on page 1516. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 <Of> my vote. <laughs> okay. Um, so if you were looking, he's after Nahum and before Haggai and Zechariah and Malachi. Hey, yeah. <laughs> so there is Zephaniah and we also looked at Zechariah this week, so we have those two. Um, but when we looked at Zephaniah this week, uh, we're focusing primarily on chapter 1. Did we see anything that was an echo of, of what we've already seen? Anything new? What was it called, for instance? Now you're rumbling. A day of wrath, a day of trouble. Lots of day references, right? Okay, so we see in Zechariah that it's a day of wrath, distress, distress. I heard trouble. It's probably a similar or, or maybe the same word depending on your uh, translation. Devastation and desolation. Okay. Uh, devastation, did you say? Devastation. Desolation. Darkness. Darkness. And desolation and darkness. We've seen that one before for sure. Trumpet and alarm. A day of trumpet and alarm. Okay. Thick, thick darkness. Right. Clouds again and thick darkness. Mm -hmm. So it didn't just say darkness, it says both. And we've seen that before. We've seen clouds and thick darkness last week as well. But um, Judy was starting to bring out a trump, uh, the trumpet, a day of trumpet and battle cry, right? So we see in this, um, we see war or battle. And that includes a war cry, a trumpet, all of those <coughs> distinctions, right? All those things that we're told about it. Um, and what... Who is the focus in this chapter? What group of people? Ju yes, Jews. Judah. Um, and so they're being punished for what? Sins. Yes, they're being punished for Judah's sins or evil, um, right? So the focus here primarily is on Judah. It's really easy in a lot of these prophecies to focus on the judgment of the nations. Because that's absolutely true. It's a huge part of the day of the Lord. But we can't forget that God's people are also going to be judged. Okay? So, what did you see anything else in Zephaniah? In verse 8 of chapter 1, it's called something in particular. The Lord's sacrifice. The Lord's sacrifice. Right. The day of the Lord's sacrifice. Um, so again, in this in this passage, primarily focusing on Israel or on Judah in particular, um, he'll he'll punish the princes, the king's sons, uh, those who clothe themselves in foreign garments. I will punish on that day those who leap on the temple threshold, who will fill the house of their Lord with violence and deceit. So you see some of what's going on there and what God is, is judging them based on and for. So he's judging them, he's punishing them for their evil, for their sin, for how they handled and, and treated the temple, how they handled and treated himself. And so he's bringing about a sacrifice. Don't ever think that God is not the one doing this. He's bringing this about. Okay? He may use outsiders to do it. He may bring, he's done that many a time, but this is directly from God. Um, there'll be a sound of a cry from the fish gate. You were they say? had a warning because they, they watched Israel. Right. And they didn't learn from that. Absolutely. That is such a key thing for us mm -hmm. to remember yeah. that almost a hundred years after Israel was taken into captivity, Judah was taken into captivity. When you talk about those early captive, uh, the, what we've studied through Daniel and Ezekiel, 
of Judah, the southern kingdom, going into captivity, part of their judgment was a harsher judgment because they had seen what happened to what God calls their sister, Israel. He's also called brother. I mean, there's, there are different references, but there were Oholabah and Ohola, or whatever those two words were for the, for the sisters when the imagery was given, that Israel, the northern kingdom, had never followed God from the time of the split. Mm -hmm. They had set up their own idols, their own altars, and they had never returned, literally returned, to Jerusalem, let alone worshiping God where God said to worship him. They set up their own places and their own gods, and no king was ever good in Israel. Whereas in Judah, you had some godly kings and some ungodly kings, those who... Um, walked in the ways of maybe David it was referred to, walks in the way, way, ways of God, or that did evil in the sight of the Lord. You know, those were the references in the ways. Some started well and ended bad, badly, and some started badly and ended well. But most were kind of set in stone. And you, they could have a really great father and a horribly evil son. It just went back and forth. But that went back and forth in Judah, but they also had the physical place. They had... Jerusalem. They had the temple. They had the worship going on there if they participated. The feasts and festivals were going on because they had a temple until the captivity and the destruction by Nebuchadnezzar that God brought about. You know, God called Nebuchadnezzar. So, Zephan, in reference to that, they had that, that picture in front of them. They saw what Israel had done and God directly spoke through the prophets and said, this is why I'm doing what I'm doing, so there's no doubt. Okay, so now how does that apply to us? All of this has been written, right? The New Testament tells us all of this has been written. We have no excuse. We have no excuse for our instruction. Mm -hmm. And we have no excuse. And we have what we're studying right now, which hasn't been fulfilled yet. They had... The prophecies of then, that the nearer prophecies that were going to be fulfilled through the captivity by Assyria of the northern kingdom, through the captivity by Babylon of the southern kingdom. Those were all prophesied. God told them, and told them, and told them, and told them. And if they would repent, he might relent. That was one of the patterns over and over. They had prophets that were telling them what? You saw that this week. What were their prophets telling them? Everything's okay. What's the word? Peace. Peace. Right? So they had, it's not necessarily in this part, but I'm going to write it up here anyway. They had false prophets, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Saying peace. Peace. When there was no peace is what it says. Peace. Peace. When there wasn't it, nothing's going to happen. We even saw it in the New Testament last week in... Uh, Malachi? No, I'm sorry, that's Old Testament. Um, um, Jude, I forgot where we were. But it, it talks about where um, they, for all, there's this group of people saying, when is he going to come back? He's not going to come back. Nothing's changed since the beginning of time. And they willfully ignored that the flood happened. And that was a judgment of God. And that's what it says. They're willfully ignorant. There's another uh, way of putting that. Where is that? Oh, it'll come to me. Yeah. Um, but anyway, they had, they had false prophets. We don't want to get too stuck back into the prophecies that re occurred and were fulfilled in those earlier times. But we saw this week, there will also be false prophets during the day of the Lord. Telling people, don't worry about it. Because, again, New Testament tells us that Peter and Paul were writing to people that they were having to say... Um, I know you've been told this. It's Jude. No, it's not Jude. Gosh, yes. it's <laughs> um, Next, um, First Thessalonians and Second Peter were, were where we were last week. Uh -huh. yeah. uh, it's the beginning of one of them. Um, Second Peter three ten. Okay, maybe that's it. Um, what does he say there? And not to get on a rabbit trail. But, I'm already on one, so that's okay. <laughs> it is well, Second Peter 3. While you're looking, but just kind of like, you know, what's going on now, you know, like with Brussels. Oh. And you get these people on the news go, nothing's going to happen here. You know, everything's contained, everything's in control, and I'm like, mm, no. Right. Well, so, and, and on the one hand, we don't need to go into a panic in this moment because it isn't happening right now and here. But why would we not look at those things and say, they're just, they, yeah. these are just practice sessions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because they're Crazy. easy targets. 
And they're easy targets. They're, they're not allowed in, in Belgium to go out on raids in the at night. Right, after five o'clock or after, something. Yeah, yeah. at the yeah. So if you're if you're a criminal, are you going to do your You just know, as soon as the sun goes down, I'm going to do anything I want. The police aren't going to come out. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. I just, yeah. That's, that's comforting. We're together here. Yeah, <laughs> that's real comforting. Well, we, we do have the false prophets. It is in Second Peter 3 where they're, will, they're showing their willful ignorance, just saying Nothing, nothing's going to change, nothing's going to happen, just like you're yeah. saying. Don't worry. It's not... This is America. Yeah. We can't, that's not going to happen here. Oh, we live within 70 miles or so of Chattanooga. Chattanooga, yeah. Where the soldiers were shot because right. they're in a place, soldiers it's on American soil that cannot carry weapons. Mm -hmm. Right? And you know, the, the I saw a meme the other day on Facebook where there's a guy and he's just got this expression on his face and you can kind of see a gun in his face and it goes, you can't have that gun here. This is a gun-free zone. <laughs> you can't pull that weapon on me. I mean, and it's that's how ridiculous mm -hmm. it has become. Mm -hmm. <sighs> yep. I was going to say more, but I'll. We, yep. went, we went to renew our gun carry gun rights right. in Maryville, and I asked the woman that took care of us. I said, "Is there somebody? Because you can't take your gun in." I said, "Yeah." Um, I said, is there anyone in this building that has a gun? She said, oh, no, we're a gun-free zone. I said, well, that's very comforting. <laughs> <laughs> and that door is locked and nobody can get in right. unless they go through a gun uh, yeah. detector, right? They're like, yeah, no, that doesn't happen. No. That's not good. Okay, so as we finish up with Zephaniah and we look at anything else that we might be able to see, there's more here. Mm -hmm. What else is talked about in, Re in Zephaniah that's going to happen? Kind of the good news. What's the good news? Yeah. Mm -hmm. There is a, a person that's talked about over and over and over again. Mentioned, I think, four or five times. I'm sorry? It's a shout for joy. Okay, there's a shout for joy. All right. But there's going to be a king, right? Yes. Okay. Who is this king? Jesus. Right. He is. So there's going to be a king. It's going to be Jesus. And what's he going to do? What does a king do? He rules. He rules, he rules, right? He's going to rule. Okay? So he's mentioned more than once. He's mentioned several times. And as a part of that, there's going to be a restoration of Israel. Mm -hmm. The room that... There you go. Always remember that. In that restoration of Israel, Jesus is going to reign as king. Okay? What time is that on our Revelation timeline? It ends with the word rain. <laughs> Thousand year rain. That's <laughs> right. Okay, so that's that's an important part of uh, what we know. Um, but we also know through Revelation, uh, through Zephaniah, that heaven and earth are destroyed. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Earth devoured, devoured in the fire. Okay. Which is, again, I mean, I'm rewriting it, but this is what we're finding this week as well. Heaven and earth are destroyed. Okay, so that's all part of the day of the Lord. So we've already seen that. It starts with the seventh trumpet, but it extends through this restoration time, this time of Jesus reigning here on the earth, this thousand-year reign. So and at the end of that, heaven and earth will be destroyed. Okay. Okay. Is that in Zechariah, not Zephaniah? Yeah, Zechariah. Okay, I know it's in Zechariah, but I was thinking it was also in Zephaniah. Zephaniah. Okay, in verse 18. Okay, good. Yeah, right, all the earth will be devoured. That's uh, chapter 1, verse 18. Okay. Um, okay, so now let's move on to Ezekiel. And we looked at Ezekiel 13 and Ezekiel 30. Did we find anything new, anything else? What's the focus? What nation is specifically kind of really talked about their destruction in this chapter? Uh, chapter 13. 
I'm trying to remember who these are. Jerusalem is mentioned absolutely. So there's going to be a battle against Jerusalem specifically, right? A battle against Israel, which again, we've seen some of this before. But it's something that, for me, sometimes kind of gets lost. Like we talk a lot, thank goodness, we can talk a lot about God drawing his people and gathering his people back to the land. And we've already seen that in our time starting to happen, or it's prior to some of us. But it's starting in the 40s, 1940s, when the nation of Israel was established as a nation, the world recognized it eventually, and people started coming back to Israel. So we started seeing that. Wait, I, maybe not you, but I had a tendency to think, okay, so nothing, God's going to protect them, nothing bad's going to happen to them, doesn't matter who their enemies are, and they have been miraculously by God protected in ways that cannot be explained mm -hmm. other than miraculously. That is true. Mm -hmm. Nobody will ever be able to push them into the sea as, as their enemies want them to happen. But there's also a time in this time when there's a great a deal of bad that's going to happen against Israel and Jerusalem, specifically Jerusalem. And so there's going to be a battle against Israel. Um, there's also going to be, within this uh, it, within Ezekiel, it talks a lot about the destruction of a specific nation. Egypt, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Some of what was talked about about Egypt was the prophecy that was going to be fulfilled by a specific man in our history. In history, not our history, but that we know of historically. So it was a near prophecy fulfillment through Nebuchadnezzar. Mm -hmm. But there's more to it here as well. There's more that's going to happen against. So it's not. It's some. For instance, when Egypt is mentioned in judgment, it's mentioned during the day of the Lord's talks. So there's also going to be um, destruction for during the day of the Lord. It's one of those times when don't get too confused that Nebuchadnezzar's name was brought up because that did that was future at the time, but it is going to happen. It did happen against through Nebuchadnezzar, but there's more. And in both Daniel and Revelation, um, Babylon is mentioned in the end, and so is Egypt in Daniel. Okay, So again, when you're looking at the Ezekiel passage that's talking about Egypt, Egypt is part of that end time, the day of the Lord. Okay, anything else that we learn from... This is where we see... Ezekiel is where we see the false prophets that are predicting peace or saying peace, peace. That's where we found that. So it wasn't too far off um, in, in what we were looking at. Okay. Again, we could we could go through a, a lot of detail, but and it is difficult sometimes when you're reading a passage of, of prophecy to be able to distinguish: is he talking about something that's for us already been fulfilled? Or is it still part of the future? And sometimes there'll be little words in there like, for instance, a complete and utter, which Egypt still exists, for instance. Something like that, um, that, that help you know that it's transitioning between uh, end and all. Okay, so as we go forward, we also see it's a day of clouds, a time of darkness and gloom for the nations. We've seen that before. Right? It's a day of wrath, distress, clouds, thick darkness. We see that also in the Ezekiel passages. So we know over and over they're all talking about the same time. Okay? Okay. Anything else? They also, other nations, Ethiopia, Libya, Put, Lud, and Arabia are mentioned. Um, and then it says... In verse 13 of chapter 30, for instance, part of how you know this is the end is it says there's no more prince there. There will no longer be a prince there. Well, Egypt has continued, and Egypt has had leaders. Whether they're prince, called princes or not, even back in the biblical days, they were called pharaohs or instead of king, for instance. So this is saying in uh, Ezekiel 30, verse 13, there will no, they'll no longer be a prince, and the pride of her power will cease. A lot. She'll be scattered around the nations. She'll be scattered, right. So there is a nearer fulfillment that would have happened from um, 
Ezekiel's time, before ours, there was a, there's more coming in the end. So it's, it, uh, Egypt does um, take part in the day of the Lord. Okay, so now as we look at Zechariah, what do we see in Zechariah? Jerusalem. There we go. We got a, the battle against Israel, specifically against Jerusalem and Judah are mentioned, right? Mm -hmm. Half of the city will be taken captive. Mm -hmm. Okay, half the city will be taken captive. Right. Um, very, very specific. Now, what happens as a result of those who come against Jerusalem? Who comes against them? Jesus. Uh -huh. Right. The Lord comes against them. Jesus mm -hmm. comes against them. So, not only is there going to be this battle against, you're going to see the Lord is going to war or battle against those who came against, those who war. This is where um, he stands on the Mount of Olives and it splits in two and the run that passes through. Yes, so he stands on the mount. His feet are on the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives is east of Jerusalem. So that you can understand. So basically, if he's standing on the Mount of Olives facing Jerusalem, and his feet are on the Mount of Olives, it splits, and part of the Mount of Olives goes to the north, mm -hmm. and part of it goes to the south, which creates a valley that heads east and west, right? Mm -hmm. So Jerusalem would be part of that valley, and they can, some can um, flee through that valley, correct? Basically, pass under his legs, in essence. Um, now, that, that tells you a little bit of something about the size of our God, <laughs> right? Because if I, 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 Jesus, I don't know if he was my size, but Jewish people aren't necessarily very large, so he might have been my size in his earthly body. But if I were to go and even stand on one of those little knobs over there, um, and it starts splitting, I'd be in trouble in a hurry, right? <laughs> but somehow, he's able to stand, and it splits, and, and it's a huge marker. So you've got, um, you've got Jesus on the Mount of Olives, and it splits. And there's, there's uh, streams of water, there's a valley formed, there's physical changes to that area that are mentioned as well, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, with Jesus coming to the Mount of Olives, here's something we haven't addressed yet. Part of the day of the Lord includes what? Revelation 19, the chapter 19. What is, what is happening in Revelation 19? Jesus, Jesus comes, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to use part of my after column over here, sorry for my before. I mean, my during column, so I have an extension here. So this is going to include the day of the Lord. The during part of the day of the Lord is going to include Jesus returning, Jesus coming. Okay, It's stated very specifically and clearly sometimes, and sometimes it's just part of he's here. If he's going to be ruling and reigning on the earth, which we, not if, since, he's going to be ruling and reigning on the earth, and we've already covered that, as as king, he's going to be on the earth. And in a physical way that we can see and all, is he now on the earth? No. I mean, God's spirit is everywhere. But Jesus, as a king on earth, is not here right now. But he's got to come, right? So we know in Revelation 19, that event happens. So Revelation 19 is prior to Revelation 20. <laughs> right? And Revelation 20 tells us about the thousand year reign. He has to come to reign and rule. And who comes with him? And the saints, the saints right. All of the holy ones come with him, and we rule and reign with him on this earth. Okay? Um, he's king, and it tells us in Zechariah what we've already seen. He's king over all the earth. And it talks about the time of his coming. Okay. 
Now it also talks about what is going on in Jerusalem during this time. As a result of this battle and after the battle, what begins happening with everybody that survives? What's that? You're reading. Okay. Waters flow out of Jerusalem. Okay, we've got water flowing and um, the and land changed. I'm sorry? The, the land changed. Yes. Mm -hmm. The land changes in what way? People live in the land and no longer. Everybody, everything becomes a plain mm -hmm. and Jerusalem rises up. But Jerusalem is all already higher. So mm -hmm. when you when you look in Psalms mm -hmm. at the very end, it talks about the songs of ascent. Mm -hmm. You know, psalms and songs are hard to say in the same sentence. Yeah. But the book, Psalms, has at the end of it, some of the latter psalms are the songs of ascent. Mm -hmm. This is what they would sing as they were walking up and into Jerusalem. They were ascending. So Jerusalem was already set as a city on a hill. Okay, In this time, it's going to be even that much more prominent. Everything's going to be a plain, and Jerusalem is going to be a higher point. Okay? So that's one of the things. What were you saying otherwise? Okay. No longer um, a curse, and they will dwell in security. Okay, so we've got no curse. And that's specific to um, Israel, I believe, Jerusalem, right? Mm -hmm. But they're going to live in security. Okay. Are they living in security now? No. Mm -hmm. no. Can't even come Absolutely close to saying not. that, right? They're not. Yeah, there is security because God does, God superintends and God does protect. It's amazing when you hear some of the stories of literally a missile yes. flying to him and then just landing in the, in the water mm -hmm. and nobody gets hurt. Uh, that's not always the case because sometimes things do get blown up. But God has a purpose in every bit of that. Um, but what's going to happen in Jerusalem? I'm sorry? Well, there's going to be, yeah, at first, but after the battles, after the Lord fights against their enemies, people are survivors after all of that, what are they going to do? Mourn? <laughs> well, they will mourn. <laughs> it's much better than that. <laughs> it's at the end of chapter 14. What are they going to do? They're going to come to Jerusalem. What are they coming for? And the wealth of the nations. Yeah. <laughs> people are going to, yeah, God's people are going to be brought to Jerusalem to dwell. Right. So there's going to be the remnant that's brought. But what are the nations going to do? The ones that survive? They're going to come to Jerusalem. This is after, remember? After. These are the survivors. <laughs> oh, I should be putting this... Uh, it's not after the day of the Lord, but it's after that battle. After all that happens, the, the nations are going to come to Jerusalem to worship. Should that be under after? Or no, after? it's in the during. It's it's in during. Oh, this is in the during. Is this, is this so the feast of the Is that the Feast of the Tabernacles? That's one of the times they're going to come, is the Feast mm -hmm. of the Tabernacles. Okay. But when they're coming to Jerusalem, they're going to come to worship. Mm -hmm. They're coming to worship. These are the survivors. This is during that thousand-year reign. It's one of the things that we can see is going to happen. So during the thousand-year reign is during the day of the Lord. Okay? And then if they don't come, they'll be punished. There you go. Mm -hmm. So there's also going to be the possibility that there could be disobedience. Right? So what does that tell you about humans during that time? They're still messed up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They still don't get it. They still don't get it. still messed up. But in a nicer way, they're like we are now. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay. But we saw last week through Thessalonians, we're not going to be like that, are we? No. No. We're going to be changed. Right? <coughs> and we're coming back with Jesus to rule and reign on earth. We're not like we are now. They are. During the thousand year reign, like we are now. Now, there's a difference in their circumstances because what doesn't happen during the thousand years? Who's bound? Satan. 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 So that he cannot Satan. deceive the nations any longer for that thousand years. But then he's released. What does he do when he's released? He goes right back to work. He, gather, he goes back to work, exactly. <laughs> and he gathers a group, somehow he's deceived, that lived with no 
temptation like we have to live with. with no deception, I shouldn't say temptation, because there was, even in the garden, obviously there was temptation, right? Because, sorry, it's human nature. You're told you can't have it, and what do you want? That's all you think about, all you think about, you know? And so, but that's, that's something to help you understand. What are people like? As sometimes you'll see me say, as they step into the thousand years, did I really step across anything? No. 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 I stepped from one moment to another moment unchanged. But everything on this earth will be changed in the sense that there will not be Satan deceiving people for a thousand years. So think about what's going to go on on this earth during that thousand years. And we're going to get into this in future lessons, but I want you to begin to think. Because we have a tendency, I did, I should say, I shouldn't say we, I had a huge tendency to think, okay, everything's gone, everything, we're all going to be living in that thousand years in our glorified state or whatever, we're not going to be like we are right now. Everybody, that's not true. And it's generations. Yeah, thousand years is a long time. Mm -hmm. So what does generations imply? They're still having children. They're still having children. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the people that step into that thousand years have survived the first part of the day of the Lord. There's still more of the day of the Lord, but they've, just, they've it's survived hard, this. Which is hard to believe. It's hard to imagine. I would have thought it would nobody could get through it, but there are survivors. They're livers, livers, people that are alive. Um, I don't know. There's survivors through this. There's the remnant, obviously, of God's people, Jerusalem, of Jews. There's a remnant, but there's also people throughout the world. And those people, the nations will be judged, yes, but there's going to be those that are among the sheep, not the goats. Right? In the, we saw it in the Matthew 25. Sheep and goat judgment difference. Mm -hmm. Okay? That's not over here in Revelation. That's over here in Revelation. That sheep and goat judgment. And I don't know how many times I've not heard that put in its right context. It's still a great teaching of understanding the criteria God uses that we should use for ourselves. But believing what we're seeing now, that does not fall in a time of our judgment, I don't believe. And I say, the people in this room, if you're saved, okay? There's a distinction. We're talking about a different judgment for a different reason at a different time. But, judgment is certain. Okay, in, in Zechariah, uh, but it's, it's a huge thing to remember that Jesus is returning, and here's a specific of him returning. That's he's going to be on the Mount of Olives. Um, so we know he's going to be right outside Jerusalem at that point. But we also know the battle is going to be against Israel, but there's going to be a battle specific to Jerusalem. Um, and I think you said half of the people are going to be taken captive. Uh, we see in other parts of Scripture, I think in Malachi, that two-thirds are going to be cut off and one-third is going to remain. Okay, so this is a time of that chapter tells us that's a time of refining, right? So this, this remnant that's brought through is going to have been refined. They're going to have been brought through a testing of fire. They're going to be brought through a time where the only ones that remain are the ones that have turned to him, right? Okay. Everyone will speak the same language that we said in the sweets. Okay. I'm not sure where you picked that up, but I don't doubt you. <laughs> Just um, that's at the end. Of, okay. When we're all together at the end, everyone will speak the same language. Um, that w that might be true, and if uh, I just don't know the reference to that. Okay. Um, but I, I know we'll all understand things together. Uh, Zephaniah. Uh, Three nine. Okay. Let's look at that because that's interesting. Purified lips. Uh, for then, uh, for then, I will give the people purified lips that all of them may call on the name of the Lord to serve Him shoulder to shoulder. Okay. And in uh, King James, it says, "I will restore to the people say pure language." Okay. Well, definitely they're speaking pure things, um, whether it's one language or not. 
I mean, that wouldn't necessarily surprise me if that's true, but because we would certainly understand each other better. <laughs> it wouldn't be because God divided people, as Kay was pointing out in the last lessons uh, at the Tower of Babel, so that they couldn't work together and achieve things beyond what they should. So maybe it'll be a time that language will come together. Can I ask a question? Yes. Can I back up a little bit? Just during that thousand year reign, we have the sheep and the goats, and they're going to be judged, right? There's I believe at the beginning the of the thousand years. So that means that some people that came out of the tribulation are still not believers. Um, at the point of that judgment, I would say, yes, you're right. There are people that have maybe not the Jews, but of the nations yeah, Jews, that have lived uh, through and are going to be judged at that point. But what's the result of the goat judgment, of the sheep goat judgment? Do you remember? Well, some get killed. Yeah. Right. They're, they're put into eternal damnation or to eternal punishment. Separated yeah. From God. Separated from God forever. And then there's going to be those left, which are the sheep, that are going to enter into his rest. It's just that I had a note here that said salvation is still happening with the Jews and Gentiles. Absolutely. And that is such a huge point we need to remember because so many teach that at the beginning, if even in the teaching of a rapture, which we haven't gotten to yet and really talked about, but if we believe a rapture happens over there on our timeline, that they believe after that, God's, they'll even say the restrainer that's mentioned in Second Thessalonians is specifically the Holy Spirit. Now, if God wanted us to know that it was the Holy Spirit, He would have told us that. He tells us in other places. It just said there's a restraint on the man of lawlessness now. That restraint will be removed. That's what it says. Um, part of what's going to allow him to just be able to do what to be revealed and to uh, do the things that he's going to do. But um, if we begin to say and think that that's the Holy Spirit being removed from the earth, then there can't be salvation on the earth after that. That's a very jump, big jump, and I think it's a very concerning jump to me. Um, so, plus, David even tells us back in the days when they didn't have an indwelling Holy Spirit, where can I go to get away from you? You know, and he's saying it in a good way. Everywhere I go, if I went to the depths of Sheol, he says, you would be there. There's no place that God can't get to. That's a very good thing. Right? Very comforting thing. But it's also a very, should be feared, terrifying thing. We can't, in darkness, do any deed that he doesn't see. Be sure and know your sins will find you out. That's also a good thing. Because I've always told my children, they hate it, but I've taught them. I think they like it now. But I told them, I never want you to get by with anything. I want you always caught. Because the worst thing that can happen to anybody is they get by with something. Mm -hmm. Because they begin to think they got by mm -hmm. with it. Right. I would rather, now, we do things all the time that we get by with from the world standards, from other people knowing, but God knows. And that's the thing we always have to keep. I would rather my children have that, you know, smack right away. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they learn that lesson. But it's not always the way God does it, especially as we grow in our relationship with Him. Mm -hmm. He does bring conviction if we'll listen. And we can repent. And if it's something I do need to have a smackdown for, God may bring that. But it does come in consequences, and it certainly comes in in a broken relationship with Him. You know, breaking in our relationship, not a completely broken, forsaken relationship. But okay. I have a question, and yes. this might lead to a rabbit trail. I don't know. <laughs> but we have said, we said from when we studied this before, and we studied it now we see things progressing. Right. And people will say, we need to repent, we need to repent. And we do need to repent. Right. That's true. But it's not going to change anything. Okay. Because I know the end of the book. Right. So how... You how do you know, reconcile you, that in your how head? How do you reconcile that in your head? You know that no matter... This, that this is going to happen. Mm -hmm. Right. Because he says it's going to happen. Right. But yet we're saying, if you, well, if you just say you're sorry and you repent, then you're then it's not going to happen. We, that we have the power to stop this, and we don't. No. Um, we don't ultimately have that power. We have, what we have is, uh, it, I'd love to do the study on Romans, 
um, for the instance, mm -hmm. because it's another four-parter. Um, so I hesitate to mention it, but like I say, I'm just going to keep going. So if y'all if y'all hang with me, in the book of Romans, as I studied it, I came up with and I heard some of this is other teaching, and I'm bringing it together and making it my own. But you'll hear me, and I haven't said this in a while. There is the idea of railroad tracks. And so you've got two tracks, right? Now we've got the cross ties, but I'm talking about the rails, mm -hmm. the iron rails, right? We have the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man. Those are two rails, side by side, concepts that are absolutely 100% true. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sovereignty of God, which means he is in control of all things at all times, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But there's also the responsibility of man. Okay, now here's the thing. Those rails on a railroad track, the only way the train stays on track is if those rails are made the right width, stay side by side, and parallel, correct? Mm -hmm. Now you see sometimes they cross like this mm -hmm. and they go back over and the train can kind of almost jump that and go. But if we decide in our theology that we are going to make this one thicker and more important than this one, and God has made them equally important. This is something I can't grasp, because I think this one's stronger, right? Yeah, but if we lean more on this one, if our train leans more onto this one, guess what's going to happen? It's going to totter. It might completely derail. If we lean more on this one and kind of let God just sit up on his throne and who can, he's, he's, yeah, he's, mm -hmm. he's not really that active and involved, we will derail. So we need to keep those together side by side. And the word reconcile is to bring them to a point together. Okay? If we try in our feeble attempts and minds to reconcile those two, we're going to derail our train. Mm -hmm. God, for whatever reason in his sovereignty, has made those two truths to be equally important. And I'm not saying he doesn't talk about one more than the other. I've never gone through and marked that in my Bible to see. But those are two truths all the time, side by side. Now, if, you're, if you've ever taken an art class and know anything about what we call perspective, what do we mean? If I look, if I put two parallel lines in a distance, what happens? They look like they come together. Mm -hmm. That's our perspective. Is that's how the two of them come together. But we know in our minds, as we stand right here on our track, those rails are not anything but side by side going down the line. And I say that very carefully and clearly because going to how do we hang on to and reconcile these thoughts? This is one of those. Okay. God sovereignly has said this will happen. What is my responsibility in it? Can I change the events that God has said is going to happen? No. no. All I can do is my responsibility, mm -hmm. which is to believe it and act on it, to have accepted his salvation that he provided everything for over here. But for whatever reason, he made me have to take part in that. And stay on track. Always remember, keep your theological train on the two rails. We're not a monorail system. It's two rails. God's sovereignty and man's responsibility. Okay? So sometimes some groups, some teachings, some things that you might be either involved in now or whatever. You, there's man's terminology for all of this, and we can start throwing out Calvinism versus Arminianism, and I hate ists and isms. I don't want to study them. <laughs> I want to study this. Yeah. But some of those have some great and awesome truths in them. But only if they agree with this. That's the only time any ist or ism is right, is if it agrees with this, okay? And as I had a pastor one time, every little group wants to take their little piece of the theological pie and focus on that, and that's kind of a derailing, okay? So just be careful. So in the how do we live, it really boils down to I can't control everything out there, but I have a responsibility, right? okay? So and in that responsibility, it might be to preach the word. Go ahead. And, but we have our responsibility, but there will be people who don't, who are on that track. Exactly. 
and so right. And that's where the responsibility you hear me say, not right. the salvation right. of man. Right. The, respons the responsibility of man. Right. And that's man, God deals with nations, God deals with corporate uh, settings, you know, big groups, mm -hmm. but it's really all about the individual. So even within Jerusalem, it, the city, or even within Israel overall, God's nation, Judea, Israel, however you, you know, want to put that together, it's still about the individual. And they're going to be part of a remnant. So God will possibly, and at times, save, an entire, save from a circumstance an entire nation, our country, or Israel, while there's still going to be a judgment of the individual within it. And you have your responsibility within whatever home you're in, whatever nation you're in, whatever job you're in. You, it's, it's every little thing is part of, falls into your category of responsibility. And the to other follow, thing is... To follow his commandments. Yes. Mm -hmm. How many times does he say that? How many times? Yeah. That's simple. To be the you. Right. Mm -hmm. And getting derailed sometimes in our theology, and I'm using theology not loosely, but I'm using it as a very broad term, because theology literally is the study of God. Um, but in our, so it might be better to say instead of theology, I might better say in our religion, and not in the bad use of that word, because <laughs> sometimes we, we just want to throw out religion. Mm -hmm. Well, religion or doctrine are the teachings that should come from this. Mm -hmm. Is that a bad thing? No. It's not a bad thing to have doctrine. As a matter of fact, God says all things are written, all scriptures written for our instruction. Mm -hmm. for, for part of it is for doctrine. So that we have teaching. But if they become things we write down for me to tell you how you're supposed to live because I figured it all out. <laughs> Isn't that another mm -hmm. definition of religion? Mm -hmm. Man's way to God. Islam is a religion. Islam is a religion. Mm -hmm. Buddhism and, is a religion. What's that? Buddhism. Yeah. yeah, they have ways and practices and ideas and beliefs. It's, not, it's in line with that. not in alignment with this. Right. And there can be some good practices within that. You can get some things right. But I, we have, some people have a tendency in our practices to start making lists of right and wrong and do's and don'ts. Mm -hmm. And if I'm doing that for myself, that's okay, because I'm trying to figure this whole thing out. But if I start handing you that list, <laughs> there's a problem. We have, we're, yeah, Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> um, and the problem is, you're going to have a problem with me, but really God's going to have a problem with me. That's called legalism. But it's so strange, but legalism is easy. Isn't it easy yeah. to start making a list of things? Let me check off our things. Man, we got our shoulders back. And you're not doing that. Yeah, that's right. I don't even have to look at that list anymore. I've got it so out of control. But guess what? You failed number 14. I just saw you. <laughs> Three fingers back at me whenever you're pointing the fingers. Three fingers back at me. So always remember, that doesn't mean that we can't look at other people's lives and by the word of God speak into that life and we see them not following God's ways. Just make sure it's not Peggy's ways. Right? Peggy's ways are right for Peggy. Peggy's ways aren't necessarily right for anybody else. But the other comes true too as well. Okay, in the book of Malachi, let's let's kind of start getting to that. Was there anything we had not seen before, something we need to add? It's called what? Great and terrible. Another word is awesome. Who can endure it? Right. And we've seen that phrase before, right? Mm -hmm. Who can endure it? The, what's implied there is it's going to be big and bad. Mm -hmm. It's great. It's terrible or awesome is another word for it. Who can endure it? We saw that, for, I believe, in Joel last week. Um, And this is also telling us it's a time of purifying. We saw it before, or we recognized it even if it didn't use that phrase. It's a time for purifying. It says it's going to refine and purify and purge. Okay, purge too. And who is that referring to? 
Jesus. Right, Jesus is going to, but who is going to get purified? Oh, those in Judah. And exactly. Jerusalem. Yeah, specifically to them. That doesn't mean it's not going to be to anybody else, but specifically to them. But this is where it also says those who return to him will be what? They'll be spared. Restore hearts of Okay. And we, there's, a, there's a lot in any of these chapters. We've seen so much of it before. I'm just kind of trying to grab some of the things that might be said a little differently or that we want to make sure are emphasized. But there's also a before statement in Malachi. What happens before the day of the Lord? Somebody has to God be God will prepare his own possession and spare them. Uh, that's during. That's during. Okay. okay. Send my messenger. Okay, who's that? Jesus. Well, Jesus is the ultimate messenger, but there's somebody that has to come before him. Elijah. Elijah. There you go. So, before Elijah has to come. Possibly. Possibly, yeah. Possibly. I wrote that. It's definitely a question we will deal with, but it's a very possible that Elijah does have to, no, it's not possible he has to come. We know he has to come, but it's possible what you're saying is that he might be one of the two witnesses. Mm -hmm. yeah. It kind of fits, mm -hmm. sort of makes sense, and there's yes. a lot of reason, but not, not a hill we're going to necessarily yeah. die on. So who's um, the second one? His okay. buddy. Oh, who is the only yeah. one who did not, who is yeah. the other man who did not what is die? Trick? These two die. Is, is the two witnesses die, right? Yeah. They're killed by um, the, the beast. The beast, the beast. Right. thank you, that has come out of the abyss. Those two die, and as Carolyn is pointing out, who's the other person in Scripture? The other, uh, Another E. e. Enoch. Enoch. Uh -huh. Very good. Uh -huh. Is appointed to man once to die. Once to die, uh -huh. and then there's the judgment. Right. So, um, who knows? That but, is, and we wouldn't, I wouldn't die on that hill either. Oh, yes, but, it but makes, it's intriguing. It, yes. Remember the uh, pastor at the... The Seder? The door. Is Elijah there? Yeah. <laughs> this is what she's referring to. So we went to a Seder, a Passover Seder, where a man who ministers to Jewish people was, was showing how a Jewish family would practice Seder, Passover, but also for us, the fulfillment of every part. And one of the things is, and I don't even think it's just at Passover, but at Passover, they set a place at their table that nobody sits in, or they have that symbology of someone coming, and they're waiting for Elijah to come. They're looking for it. They'll even send a child to the door, usually a child, somebody to the door to look outside to see if Elijah has come. It's that idea. And, um, and we see that Jesus said of John the Baptist, what did he say of John the Baptist? That he came, he came or he comes in the spirit of Elijah. Right? And he did go ahead of Jesus, came before and spoke of what needed to happen in any person's heart as they come to Jesus. It, what was his message? What was the one word message of John the Baptist? Repent. 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 Yeah. Right. We can't get to the cross bypassing repentance. And just so I always put that out there because as we're giving a gospel to anyone, a presentation of the gospel, you cannot bypass their understanding for their need for repentance. You can't bypass that. It's not just the good news, which is Jesus died. We have to say, for what? For my sins. Well, why would that matter to me if I have nothing I need to repent of? Right? If I, if I have nothing I need to ask for forgiveness for, if I have never done anything, God and I are just fine. You know, this month, God, you know, you're, you're just fine. yourself. Right. So it's, it's important to bring them to that. Um, so as we figure out just some conclusions and just some thoughts um, about the time, and, and I only distinguish the green from the black as what we heard, saw last week versus what we saw this week, but it's consistent. There's no contrast or consistency. We know that some things have to happen before the day of the Lord, and we're standing before that time, but what are the three things that we absolutely know, or four things that we absolutely know have to happen before the day of the Lord? 
The apostasy has to take place. There is a man of lawlessness, and he will be revealed, and that starts once he's revealed. We see that the moon will be blood prior to. We see a lot more, but we know that, and we know that's tied to the sixth seal, which is chronologically before the seventh trumpet. Um, and we also now know that Elijah has to come. Could that be the two witnesses? One of the two witnesses? Maybe. Okay. What's going to happen during? What's going to happen during is it's a time of darkness and gloom. It's a time of judgment of the nations, and it's a time of judgment of God's people as well. But, so basically, that covers everybody, right? Over the face of the earth, or people groups over the face of the earth. Um, at the end of it, the concluding or capping moment is the heavens and earth will pass away. The heavens and earth will be destroyed by fire, okay? We put this on our Revelation timeline at the end of the thousand years, okay? So the so day of Lord begins, the specific day of the Lord begins at the seventh trumpet and goes through the thousand year reign. So is it a 24 hour day? No. It's talking about a time day, okay? It's a, a period of time, okay? We know there's going to be, um, at a point in the day of the Lord, a battle that's focused on Israel, Jerusalem specifically. The nations are going to come against Jerusalem. But those nations are going to have God come against them, Jesus in particular. We know at some point Jesus is going to come and stand on the Mount of Olives and it's going to split. So he's going to come to earth physically stand on the Mount of Olives, and the Mount of Olives is going to split. Mount of Olives, right outside Jerusalem. We know that Egypt in particular is going to be destroyed. We know um, last week we talked about other nations. That their Babylon is, is going to be destroyed. We didn't talk about Babylon this week hardly. Um, for Israel, their fortunes are going to be restored. That's not going to happen until the thousand-year reign. Not completely. That's when they will live in security. That's when their fortunes will be returned. But they're going to be coming back. God's going to be building into them. To a certain extent, their fortunes will be restored, even in Jerusalem in particular. But that battle's going to happen. And there's, there's many that are killed or destroyed during that time. Others that survive. Um, but it's a point, the reason is God's judging Judah's sin. Same as judgment all along. Um, it's going to be a time of the Lord's sacrifice. There's going to be prophets during that time saying, don't worry about it. It's all fine. Mm -hmm. And as Deb was pointing out, similarly, here we're supposed to be soothed and comforted by the events that have happened in Paris and by the events that happened in Brussels because they happened over there. They're not going to happen here. We're America. Yeah. We're too strong. Yeah. Um, Jesus is coming, and he's going to rule. While he's here, he's going to rule as king. He's going to rule over the whole earth. The beauty is we get to rule with him. Um, what else can we know? If people return to him, they're the ones that are spared. We have this distinction that we don't say it in these terms so much. Believers will make it. Non-believers have a lot to fear. Have everything to fear. So there's that. Um, and afterwards, because the old is destroyed, the new heaven and new earth. We saw that last week, but we also see it in Revelation. Okay? So we're pretty clear on something that if somebody had asked you about the day of the Lord before, could you be that definite about all of this? It comes from a lot of scripture. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and most of it says almost identical things, but sometimes there's a few distinctions here and there. Okay. So next week, the subject turns to the mystery of God. And now you're wondering, what mystery? <laughs> Remember, and the two Revelation and the two tells us, Revelation 10, verse 7, in them, in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, the mystery of God is finished. So there is a mystery. So number one, we gotta, we got to realize there is a mystery, and we got to realize what is it and... What's it going to be? And then we get into the nations gathered at Armageddon. Um, well, actually, the nine is 144,000, two witnesses, and the mystery of God. So that mystery of God is part of it. We cover a lot, too. Cover, covering a lot. So, yeah, strap on your pencil and <laughs> right on through. Okay, we'll pray, and we'll have our uh, meal and our lesson from Kay.
And um, we are past the halfway point again. Uh, last week was the midway point, so we're sliding into home, I guess, or rounding third, maybe. Um, 